Welcome to the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that all children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied by an adult. Hi there and welcome to the Sonic Society. I'm Jack Ward. David Alt was going to join me as usual, but since we made a plan to do the introductions timely on the day, well, sometimes you feel a little under the weather, and this is one of those times that David has been, well, let's say arguing with a meteorologist, I guess. Before we get right into tonight's features, a few pieces of news. General Electrics has just released their first audio drama in, what, 70 years? That's incredibly huge news for the community and shows how the revitalization of our favorite medium is taking place. You can go on iTunes and pull down The Message, but we're going to try to have episode one on the Society soon, so if you forget, don't worry. Fred Greenhall and Final Room Productions have released their latest opus, the audio drama adaptation of the famous graphic novel of Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez, Lock and Key. If you go to Audible right now, you just might be able to get to listen to it for free. Hey, that rhymes. Lock and Key and free. Anyway, Get out your blasters and rocket gear, because coming up this Friday is episode three of Biff Straker and Spaceways with The Fallen Angel. Good stuff. Looking forward to that. Josh Price has just sent me, like literally 30 minutes ago, the latest of his remastering and editing, this time the deadline episode, Rule of Three. That's going to be exciting to listen to and get back up on the feed. On the weekend, I recorded my part for upcoming Leap Audio with Mark Brzee and also one of the main roles in our remake of Deadline episode slash End of the Seven Deadly Sins, Faith. I've got to tell you, Tanya Malevich really knocked this performance out of the park, but when doesn't she? And it really made me work harder than I ever have to make this acting up to the challenge. Furthermore, the incredible Kai and Chris Conroy and John Bell got together again to recreate one of my favorite deadline shows, Clay Pigeon Shooting, last Wednesday, and it's now in post-production as well. My wife Ginny has been working overtime for the last four months, putting all our shows on the YouTube channel, so make sure you're subscribed there to hear both EVP shows and the Sonic Society. As well, she's been crocheting and knitting up a storm for the upcoming HowCon Science Fiction Convention. You can add her at Canadian Chica at Facebook group. She's got a table in HowCon, and I'm thinking of putting our first four episodes of Biff Straker on a disc for people to purchase. Who knows? We may even get the opportunity to get our Biff Straker special action figures out by then. Captain Radio himself, Richard Summers, has also jumped on board the Spaceways team and is helping us with editing. Sharon B. was just talking to me last night about new music. I am incredibly grateful to have such fantastically talented people helping us out. Tonight's show is part of a new kind of phenomena in viral audio drama work. Most folks are familiar with the Serial podcast, but without giving too much away, you haven't heard anything yet. With thanks to the creators of this new Canadian series out of Vancouver, Paul Bay and Terry Miles, we are all happy to present to you here on the Sonic Society Episode 3 of the Black Tapes podcast. Now on with the show. Lord, here's a just reward. Bring me my devil just behind the door, she said, and flies down the road Hello. like I'm thunder. I'm recording one of 11 calls from somebody named Alex Regan. Home it's Richard Strand. Okay, goodbye. Now we're recording. Cool. And I'm going to do the intro part as well. Yeah. My, my emphasis, I think, was just a little bit too much like, dun, dun, I don't know. Let me just do it again. <laughs> And we'll go flying through the kingdom of the universe. She said she saw someone standing over his bed. Is it true that you disappeared for five days? I know, I know. It's, it's like adding another layer of creamy on top of creamy. Fly away. 
The Black Tapes podcast is an exploration of life, belief, faith, and occasionally the paranormal. This season, we're focusing our lens on the work of the Strand Institute and its enigmatic founder and president, Dr. Richard Strand. Last week, our look into the shadowy figures appearing in two separate videos took us to San Francisco, where we discovered a brand new strangeness. This week, the story of Dr. Richard Strand and his mysterious black tapes cases continues. We'll be telling our story in order, week to week. So if you haven't listened to the first couple of episodes, go back and start there. We'll be here when you get back. From the National Radio Alliance and Minnow Beats Whale, it's the Black Tapes Podcast. I'm Alex Regan. Last episode, things got a little complicated with the Torres family, and they've declined our requests for additional interviews. Don't worry, we're not dropping this. We will contact them to continue exploring their story, but in the interim, we need to respect their right to privacy through what must be a trying time for them. Last week I outlined some information our research team dug up regarding Strand. It concerned his wife, who went missing under mysterious circumstances in 1997. I'll have an update on this part of our story later in this episode, but in the meantime, last week, Dr. Strand left me a very intriguing message. Hello, Alex. It's Richard Strand. I'd like to apologize for the other day. I'll be up in Seattle next week, and if you're interested, I'm bringing along another case from my collection, from the section I believe you refer to as the Black Tapes. I think you'll find this one very interesting. Anyway, I I hope you're well. I'll leave my information with your producers. Take care. Strand was right. I did find it very interesting. But first, my producer Nick had an interesting question of his own. Why was Strand offering this olive branch? I don't know. It's probably fine, or at least it is what it is, but I'm just i not sure I see exactly what it is Strand gets out of all this. I don't know. You don't think he's just feeling bad about the way things ended between him and me with the Torres thing? Well, I think that might be part of it. Okay, well, uh, maybe it's as simple as he's just looking for an audience. Maybe. Or pressure from his publisher to promote his upcoming book? Hmm. Strand doesn't strike me as someone who would care too much about that kind of thing. Yeah, I agree. Why don't I ask him? So I did. It took me a few minutes to get into it, but... Eventually, Strand figured out what it was I was trying to ask. So to be clear, are you asking why I'm willing to share this new black tape case with you? Or why I'm willing to be involved in your story in general? Both, I guess. I'm going to play something for you. At this point, Strand pulled up a YouTube video on his laptop. The first voice is Dirk Abruzzi. The second, Emily Dumont. Two of the ghost hunting experts you'll remember from episode one. I had just been hired as an associate professor at Penn State Paranormal, and during our entire move from Michigan, I had a dark entity hovering above me. More than six people visually confirmed this fact. It followed me for weeks later. You've got to be skeptical about stuff like this. Demons? Really? Do you have any idea how rare a demonic incident is? It's like .0001%. It's very rare. We need voices of reason here. In the world of paranormal investigations, these people are considered skeptics. These are the so-called voices of reason. There's no room for scientific method. There's no difference between any of these people and the ghost hunters on reality television. You are a respected journalist from one of the most respected radio programs in the world. Working with you, I have a national platform to renew skepticism. I think ghost stories are a lot of fun. But the problem is, when people start treating the paranormal as reality, it waters down the culture infantilizes it. At some point in the future, if religious wars don't destroy the planet, nobody is going to believe society ever took issue with same-sex marriage or looked at the Bible as anything other than fiction. When you lose the skeptical spirit, it sets us back, socially and culturally. Strand went on like this for a while. His point was clear. He wants to be the voice of reason, or at the very least, a voice for reason in a world he feels is in desperate need of such a voice. He wants to help, and he wants to use the show as a platform to provide a viewpoint, counter to the majority, counter to the believers. 
I think that's a fair trade. I get to explore the black tapes, and Stran gets his platform. Let's turn our attention to another kind of tape for a moment. The demo tape. When you're a journalist in Seattle, you come across hundreds of small bands. Seattle is, after all, the birthplace of 90s grunge rock and the home of seminal indie music label Sub Pop. But when Richard Strand called to let me know he got a call from infamous Seattle underground rock band Hasta Rising, it came as a bit of a surprise. Hi, this is for Dr. Strand. My name is Keith Dabich. I'm the guitarist and songwriter in a band out of Seattle. You may have heard of us, Hasta Rising. Our lead singer, Jeff, died recently. I just heard you on Alex Regan's podcast, and I was just wondering if I could speak with you about something. It's something I think you'll want to hear. A recording? You probably already know about it, you know, because of what you do. I think they call it the unsound. My number is 206. Keith Davich, lead guitarist and principal songwriter for popular underground hard rock band Haster Rising. If you're from Seattle, you've heard of them. If you're not, you may have heard of the lead singer's violent suicide a couple of weeks ago. He hammered a knife into his chest with a polo mallet. Haster Rising was often in the news because of their ongoing conflict with the religious right. Local church groups have picketed their concerts, claiming they promote Satanism. Somebody burned down the rehearsal space in 2008, but nobody was arrested. There were reports of a live animal sacrifice at one of their concerts, but YouTube clips showed at least one incident was definitely fake. Here's the lead singer Jeff Went from an interview last year addressing that controversy. People see what they want to see. We're just trying to put on a show. It's entertainment for f So was that a real cat you killed on stage? Killing cats is illegal and subject to prosecution in the state of Washington. So that's a no. What do you think? I don't know, that's why I'm asking. You don't think that having satanic images and symbols on your album covers might be encouraging people to view your band through that lens? I'm just glad that people are looking at the album covers. Even your name, Haster Rising. Isn't Haster himself a Lovecraftian myth, one of the ancient ones? Also called the unspeakable one? You're not supposed to say his name. Why is that? You'll see. He was charming, controversial, and talented. And last month, Jeff Went was found dead in the garage in the house he grew up in. He was only 27. So, I'm guessing you have some idea of that thing he referenced? He called it the unsound? I've heard of it. It's similar to the hum, but there's more of a mythology surrounding the unsound. I read something about the hum on The Guardian last month. This unsound is different? There are several sources of the hum, all of them man-made. The unsound, however, is more interesting. I first heard about it back in 2005. My assistant at the time, Travis, brought it to my attention. He would often trawl the back channels of the deep web forums. He was really into conspiracy theories, which is why he joined the Institute. So how is the unsound different from the hum? It's quite different. Experts who have studied the limited samples we have claim the unsound is neither natural nor artificial. So that rules out what? Everything? Unidentifiable. My guess is it's synthetic, but I can't be sure until someone develops a more precise instrument to parse it. You have no idea what it is? And this is why it's one of what you're calling the Black Tapes cases. This unsound was of special interest to your assistant? He was obsessed, really. You see, the unsound comes with quite a compelling narrative. There are a number of myths that have developed around it over time. It has different names. Uh, Diabolica Lyricus, the Devil's Note. Can you tell us about some of these myths? Well, the most common myth is that the unsound summons or invites a demon into the world. A demon? An archdemon, if I remember correctly. The unsound is his voice gently asking the listener to invite him into his world. An archdemon with a gentle voice? That doesn't sound all that scary. Oh, uh, there's more. Okay. Everyone who hears the unsound dies within one year of their initial exposure. Now that's scary. There is an additional supporting myth from one of the Gnostic Gospels rejected by the Church. In fact, there are actually two oblique references to a similar sound in the Dead Sea Scrolls. What's the story? Before the time of creation, Lucifer was the angel of song, 
of music. Lucifer led a revolt against God and lost. You're familiar with this mythology. I'm with you so far. So God banished Lucifer to hell, but on his way out of heaven, Lucifer, now referred to as Satan in this particular gospel, created some kind of musical backdoor as he fell into the inferno, something sonic that would allow Satan and his minions back into the world without God knowing. This mysterious note is apparently a sound that God can't hear. The unsound. That sounds a little Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> so does most of the Old Testament. Okay. So there's this unsound that God can't hear, floating around the deep web, and a bunch of audio geeks getting heavily into the Old Testament because of it. So, where does this sound come from? Uh, there's a lot of noise surrounding the Unsound's history. There were rumors of it being a creation of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Some thought it was the Freemasons. Most claimed some affiliation with Aleister Crowley himself. There's a mountain of mythology tacked onto this. But well over a year of research led me to a scientific outpost in Antarctica in 1962. That's not very Illuminati, is it? <sighs> This team of scientists were there to study what later turned out to be a weakening of the ozone layer over the Antarctic. They were recording and cataloging electromagnetic waves and their frequencies. In the process, one of their instruments picked up this strange audio wave pattern. At first they thought it was a whale stranded under the ice, or the wind, or electromagnetic waves themselves, or more likely a combination of the three. Did they find out? No. And they never got a chance to further their research, because they all died. You're not going to tell me that they all died within a year. One of them died on the base due to a staph infection. The other four died in a mountain climbing expedition six months after their contract ended. But was this within a year of them hearing the unsound? This isn't demonology. It's just bad luck and bad weather. There was a whole article in the New York Times about that horrendous mountaineering expedition. So they all died within one year of hearing the unsound? Just like the story says. You don't think that's at least interesting? Not really. Every myth has its origin, and Antarctica in 1962 is where the dying within a year story was born. He got me. I was just about to tell Strand how I thought he wasn't open to hearing both sides. Of course a myth has to have an origin. Strand was right. His new black tape was very interesting, and it was happening in Seattle, my own backyard. Would you like to hear the unsound? Me too. It's coming up after the break. I'm Alex Regan. It's the Black Tapes Podcast. Stay with us. Dr. Strand's Black Tape number three contains a lot of research on the unsound, and, of course, a sample of the sound itself. I'm going to play it for you in a moment. But first, my producers have informed me that I have to read the following disclaimer. If you listen to the sound, you're listening at your own risk. Now, I've heard the sound numerous times, and so far, I haven't seen a single demon. But if you're afraid or superstitious, please skip ahead 10 seconds. You might want to put on headphones for this. It's interesting, isn't it? I feel like I'm hearing a different version of this thing each time I listen. I think the closest thing that describes it is... It's the audio equivalent of seeing shapes in the clouds. Maybe everybody hears something different, something unique to their own experience. I wanted to learn more about the possible sources of this unsound, so I went to one of the premier acoustics experts in the Pacific Northwest, Dr. Michael Pullman. Technically, he is what's called a structural acoustician. Okay, so what am I looking at here? So this line measures compressional waves. This one follows shear waves. That's Dr. Pullman in his lab at the University of Washington, where he teaches in the physics department. This one follows the deformation of the wave speed. Yeah, totally. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, we're all uh, acoustic nerds here. I sent Dr. Pullman a file with the unsound on it to see if he could explain why it's caused so much interest. 
why there's so much mystery generated around it. Well, it's an interesting sound, that's for sure. And what are you looking for? I'm trying to gauge a possible source. I looked at everything from structural wave radiation to flexor wave patterning to whether it fits a Bessel function for uniformity, given we know there were engines in the area where it was first recorded. Okay. Let's pretend all of that went way over my head. All right, sorry. Um, in simple terms, what you call the unsound behaves very much like a low-frequency wave. We're not supposed to be able to hear these frequencies, yet here it is emitting an audible sound. Interesting. Super interesting. What's even more interesting is in the patterning of these waves. I've plotted them out here. So notice these points? Yeah, they, it's like they get smaller and then larger over and over again. Exactly. Like a machine. In fact, it's so precise it could be an engine. So it's from a generator or something? Here's the thing. I, I believe it's a voice. A human voice? Maybe. I don't know for sure. But I think it's probably organic. It behaves like a compression wave with very precise patterning. Well, could it be a synthesizer? I think that's highly unlikely. And you're aware of the urban legend surrounding this unsound? Only what you've told me. I suppose now we have a year left to live. Yep. I'm going to stop eating kale. <laughs> that's, that's what you're going to stop eating. I hate it. It's <laughs> gross. You have to put so much stuff on So it. that was a scientific take on the unsound. But I wanted to hear from someone who actually believes this stuff. The motif of a portal to hell goes back to the early days of the church. That's Francis Dreiser. He's what those in the field of biblical theology call a demonologist. I went to see him at Pacific Christian Academy in southeast Washington state. He says he doesn't actually deal with demons per se, only with the theology and history of demons in ancient texts. If you think of the universe as God's creation, it becomes problematic when you try to locate hell. The book of Ephesians talks about the separation of a dark world and evil forces in the heavenly realms. We know from Ezekiel and Revelations that Satan and his agents are able to access our earthly realm. How does he get here? Why does God allow that? Well, the problem finds something of a solution by positing a portal, a gateway between earth and hell. Yeah, they didn't teach portals to hell in Sunday school. No, they sure didn't. But we know that there are demons who enter people's lives, sometimes possessing their bodies. Where do these demons come from but a portal? Are these portals always open? Do you know where they are? They don't work like doors. It's not permanent. They're temporal, opening for a moment and closing just as quickly. And they require a medium. Like a psychic? No, a middleman. Someone to invite them into our world, uh, a believer. Why would anyone do that? For centuries, people have partaken in ceremonies, inviting Satan and his minions into their lives. According to Revelations chapter 12, verse 4, Satan took one-third of the angels with him from heaven. Now, that's basically an army of fallen angels, and they all want access to this world. A portal. A portal. Something like... The unsound? Yes. In theory, I suppose. Do you believe the unsound is one of these portals? The unsound doesn't exist. It's nothing but a myth from a much maligned translation of the Apocrypha. Well, I have a recording of it. Of the unsound? Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, that thing floating around on the internet. You have a year to live after hearing it. Good fun. So you don't believe it's possible? At all? I've seen too much of Satan's power at work in the real world. I can't see why he would have to kill you within a certain time frame. Things like this unsound are just fuel for horror films, I'm afraid. The irony wasn't lost on me. A Bible professor laughing at the possibility of an unsound while talking about Satan like he was inarguably real. Uh, is Dr. Strand going to be here? Actually, his conference was pushed by a few days. He arrives in Seattle tomorrow morning. I love your show. Thank you. I'd like to ask you about what happened with Jeff, if that's okay. Yeah, it's cool. Are you recording? Uh, yeah, we are. Okay, uh, well, 
I was sitting right here when I got the call. That's Keith Davich, the guitarist of Haster Rising. We were at his apartment talking about the circumstances leading up to Jeff Went's suicide. So, how did you hear about Jeff's death? His sister. She lives in Portland. Must have been hard. Your band has been together for a long time. He was my best friend. It was one of the biggest shocks of my life. And yet... And yet... Maybe it wasn't that big of a surprise, you know? Like, with all the shit he was into. The drugs? Drugs, booze, sure. I guess, but... I'm talking about the occult stuff. The black magic. Weren't you all into that stuff? Mike and Rory were into it, if Jeff said we were into it. Mike and Rory, the drummer and the bassist? Yeah. But, you know, those guys were just tourists when it came to that stuff. Jeff was... He was serious. And you? I got into that stuff early on. Crowley and the Golden Dawn. I was the one that went to the deep web and found it. The unsound. The unsound. Huster Rising has been a part of the Seattle rock scene for almost a decade now. As I said earlier in the show, they're a somewhat experimental hard rock band who've courted controversy over the years for their supposedly satanic live shows. But the way Keith tells it, it's all just part of marketing their music. Well, for most of the band, anyway. The occult stuff was a way to get ourselves out there, you know? To stand out. Like, good tunes can only take you so far with so many bands out there. You gotta find a way to break, you know? Like, Maiden or Ozzy or Guar. So the black magic was a way to brand yourselves? We do look good in black. (laughs) And it's cool, too. And it was interesting. Like I said, I was really into it in the beginning. And I didn't really believe this stuff about the devil and all that, but I was into the history and the imagery. Darkness, chaos, rebellion. So it was you who introduced the occult to your bandmates? Yeah. They thought it was too derivative at first, but (laughs) they were thinking more Kiss than Sabbath. But Jeff really took to it. It was like a religious awakening to him. It was hard to treat it like a shtick when your lead singer is so... Well, I thought I was into that stuff, but Jeff... Jeff took it to a whole nother level. So it was you who brought the unsound to the group? Kind of, but not exactly. So about nine months ago, this dude comes up to me after a show down in Tacoma. Killer show. Dude buys me a beer and we get to talking. He's one of those guys that reads really deep into every single lyric, like (laughs) reading stuff I didn't even see in them, and I wrote half the lyrics. What kind of things? Uh, Like our song Moon Rider. He made some connection between the drumming cadence and the lunar calendar. It was weird. I didn't get it, but he's going to buy me beers. I'm going to let him keep talking. (laughs) And the unsound? Dude starts telling me about this sound that Lucifer created. A sound that even God can't hear. Like it's a secret code for Satan's demons to coordinate themselves or something. And then he tells me about the deep web and all this crazy sh** you can find. Tells me to download a Tor browser and writes down a web address. I listened to the sound when I got home. And you played it for the others? Yeah. They got a real kick out of the story. I didn't think anything of it, but... Like a week later, Jeff tells me I gotta come over. That he wants me to hear something. He played me this. I don't hear anything. Exactly. There was nothing there. He told me that I had to try harder to hear it. He said he was experimenting with the unsound, figuring out the message. He was really tweaked out and hadn't been sleeping at all. We were excited about our new record, but Jeff had stopped working on everything to focus on this sound. He was a mess. Sounds like he was trying to bring the occult into the music directly. He was, and it was cool at first. We thought it added a dimension to the band, but... 
when your best friend hammers a butter knife through his chest with a polo mallet, you kind of gain a new perspective. That's when you call Dr. Strand? Right around then, yeah. We just wanted to be the next Mud Honey or Soundgarden. Maybe even Nirvana with some luck. Now I don't know if I'm going to make it to Christmas. What do you mean? I heard the sound nine months ago. I probably only have three months left. At the most. There's that rumor again. You hear the sound, you die within a year. Keith sounded genuinely frightened about dying. And I have to admit, I did find this whole unsound thing a little unnerving. It's easy to get superstitious, I think, when presented with such a visceral sonic experience. It's not just your imagination at this point. It's your imagination plus one really dark, creepy, scary sound. We tried to get the other two members of Haster Rising, Mike and Rory, to speak on the record, but they politely declined. They've both apparently left the music industry, and neither plan to return to writing or recording music anytime soon. The Black Tapes Podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com slash theblacktapes. This week, we recommend Mikhail Bulgakov's literary masterpiece, The Master and Margarita. Visit www.audibletrial.com slash theblacktapes to download The Master and Margarita or any one of audible.com's more than 180,000 titles. After I left Keith Dabich's house, I received a call from Strand. He had just landed in Seattle and wanted to see if there were any developments in the story. Also, he spoke with Jeff Wendt's mother, and I don't know what he said, but apparently she was now willing to speak with us. He said he had some time tomorrow before the conference. I met him at his hotel for lunch before we were scheduled to meet Jeff Wendt's mother. So, how did you talk her into an interview? Mrs. Wendt has convinced her son was somehow harmed or perhaps possessed by evil spirits. I mentioned this is something I had a great deal of experience with. I told her I'd take a look. Can I ask you something? Of course. Why are you so interested in these black tapes of mine? If you asked me to imagine what kind of show a former Pacific Northwest Stories producer might create, this type of thing wouldn't be my first or second guess. The black tapes are really interesting, but they're only part of the story for me. I got into radio because I wanted to be Ira Glass or Terry Gross, not Scooby-Doo. <laughs> Exploring the motivations behind somebody so driven to disprove the existence of anything supernatural, that's what I'm really interested in. Me. I'm interested in the truth. Then we're interested in the same thing. There's something in the last episode of our podcast that I'd like your approval on before we upload it to the server. I'm not going to include it if you'd rather I didn't. That sounds ominous. Can I play it for you? Here. I have it on my phone. Go ahead. During one of our interviews in San Francisco, Dr. Strand told Robert Torres and myself that he was never married. The truth is, Strand was married, and his wife went missing under very mysterious circumstances in 1997. Now, I suppose he might lie about something like this to protect his privacy. But if he's willing to lie about his wife, what else might he be willing to fabricate? You're investigating me? Not really. Or... Not exactly. I'm... I'm guessing you just didn't want to share your marital status with Robert Torres. Fair enough. But? But... And again, I'd like to reiterate that I'm not going to air any of this stuff without your consent. But... To be honest, I got into this, like I said, because... You wanted to be Ira Glass and not Scooby-Doo. Exactly. I just feel like... This show has evolved into something really interesting for our audience. Not just the tapes, but everything surrounding you and your work. I'm including my own conversations with my producer Nick about my process and my mistakes. Nothing is out of bounds. If the response to episode one is any indication, our audience is a lot more interested in you than in me. Oh. I started the show because I wanted to learn about people, to profile human beings by filtering them through their occupations. I just... I don't want to get too far off course. Do you feel like you're getting far off course? 
Honestly? Why not? I'm not sure. Like I said earlier, I'm interested in providing balance to the paranormal conversation. If you think my personal life is of interest for some reason, I suppose it's fine. That's not exactly a ringing endorsement. What do you want to know? Do you mind talking about what happened with your wife? Not at all. It's not much to tell, I'm afraid. She disappeared on the highway. We were driving down the coast to Big Sur, stopped at a gas station. I went in to pay, and when I came back, she was gone. That must have been horrifying. It was. So, Strand was willing to talk about his personal life. And it looked like, for the moment at least, that I was going to get the show that I started out trying to make. This was all great, but there were a few things Strand left out regarding his wife. The fact that he was the prime suspect for a very long time, the fact that his wife's parents went on record saying they thought Strand was responsible, and finally, the assault of a psychic who had been hired to look into his wife's disappearance. Let's look at these things logically. First of all, the husband is always the prime suspect and the police eventually ruled Strand out and switched their focus to a serial murderer working in the area around this time. As for the parents? Well, my parents barely tolerated my last boyfriend. The psychic, however, is more interesting. It turns out she settled in civil court right after she dropped the criminal charges. More on this later. This is where we like to watch TV. He liked crime dramas, mostly. That's Jeff Wendt's mother. She's clearly still in deep mourning. Jeff could have easily afforded his own house, but his mother told us that he liked living here, in the house he grew up in. Are any of your family members here with you? Jeff's older sister, Alice, moved back down to Portland. They keep inviting me down, but there's just so much to do. She took us on a quick tour of the main level of the house. She wasn't comfortable taking us up to his room, but she did show us the garage, where Jeff spent most of his time. That's his recording studio. That's where I found him. I'm sorry. That must have been awful. It was. I'll be right back. Okay. Of course. She hadn't stepped foot in the garage since she discovered her son there. Nothing had been touched. It was as if Jeff were still alive and about to walk into his studio to pick up where he left off. There were a bunch of guitars hanging on the walls, a few keyboards set up next to a small mixing board. The computer he used for recording was still on. What are you doing? He was in the middle of recording something. Do you think it's weird that the police didn't take his computer? Not really. I think this is it. This is what passes for music now? Come on, it's a work in progress. What are you doing? This is the same program we use in the studio. I'm just going to mute some of the tracks. Interesting. By interesting, do you mean extremely dramatic and creepy? Why would he layer the unsound underneath everything else? I know, you can't even hear it when it's mixed in with the rest of the instruments. Oh, wow. What? Do you see this? What am I looking at? I'm guessing you don't illegally download music or movies. I pay for music and movies just like everyone else. Right. What is it? It's a torrent file. What's that? He's seeding this song. Seeding? Yeah, he's, um, he's made it available for download, for free, anywhere in the world. How many people have downloaded it? Just over six million. So, was it a demonic summoning? Was there some mystical power in the unsound that forced Jeff Went to commit suicide in such a violent fashion? Did I and the more than six million people who downloaded that song have less than a year to live? Strand seems to think it's all easily explained. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Is it? He was a gifted yet troubled young man who didn't seek medical attention. And it doesn't help that his mother fed into the whole occultism. What do you mean? Did you get a look upstairs? No. That entire second floor was a shrine to Jesus. There was some pretty violent crucifixion imagery there. Not your basic Sunday school material either. Real Raiders of the Lost Ark type stuff. So it's all easily explained. 
The unsound is natural, but not demonic. The suicidal musician is troubled, but not possessed. Sure, the Antarctic research team all died within a year in 1962, but that's where the myth began rather than proof of its potency. But what about Travis? You remember Travis, Strand's assistant obsessed with digging up strange things in the deep web? Travis, who successfully tracked down the underground recording of The Unsound? I asked Strand why Travis Collingwood left his team, and Strand told me that his grant ran out. This is true. What Strand didn't mention, however, and what he may not actually know, is that Travis Collingwood died four months after leaving the Strand Institute's employ. He was hit by a cyclist and thrown into a bus. He died instantly. Are there some things that just feel different, strange, powerful? Or does it all really depend on what you believe, what lens you choose to use, which filters you decide to apply? I'm Alex Regan. This is the Black Tapes Podcast. We'll be back again next week. The Black Tapes Podcast is a National Radio Alliance and Minnow Beats Whale production. Recorded in Seattle and Vancouver. Produced by Nick Silver. Mixed and engineered by Alan Williams and Samantha Paulson. Edited by Nick Silver and Alex Regan. Executive producers Paul Bay and Terry Miles. I hope you enjoyed the Black Tapes podcast. Listen to the very end of the Sonic Society this week. As I was recording the intro to the show, something really weird happened. And I'm not saying I created this... Because I totally didn't do it. But in the middle of my introduction, we had this weird thing stop the recording. And a message was at the end. And the only thing I can think of is maybe I recorded on top of an old track. And <laughs> out. Anyway, I leave it to you to listen to. That's the only thing I can make sense of. But I'll leave that to you as a little Easter egg after the music. Listen to that. In the meantime, please send us your email and let us know how you're doing at sonicsocietyhq.com. Heck, record a little audio email if you like and attach through the Google Drive. Visit us at the page on sonicsociety.org or the YouTube channel or like our Facebook pages for Electric Vicuna Productions or the Sonic Society. Join the Facebook group Audio Drama Radio Drama Lovers or contact us on Twitter. A thousand ways to contact us. Give healing five all for next week. And I'd say I'll see you in six. But remember, Biff Straker and the Spaceways continues on Friday night. Until then, we'll see you back here on the Sonic Society next Tuesday night. Good night. The Sonic Society is written and produced by Jack J. Ward and David Ott, with original music provided by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society through Creative Commons licensing. The Sonic Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. weekend i recorded my part for upcoming leap audio with mark brzee and also one of the main roles in our remake of deadline episode slash end of the seven deadly sins faith i gotta tell you tanya malevich really knocked this performance out of the park but when doesn't she though i mean she did some research and connected with uh tim Knopf. Apparently, you enjoy listening to audio dramas, since you're hearing this message. I'll keep it short so you can get back to the fun stuff. If you would like to see and experience how all these stories, voices, sound effects, and music come together to create theater of the mind... 
Sputnik plans to visit the Modern Audio Drama Convention in Halifax, Nova Scotia, July 24th through 26th, 2020. Meet the creators. Find out how to write, record, mix, sweeten, and produce movies that play in your head. See what the voices you hear actually look like. We never look like we sound. For all the details, visit madcon.com. That's M-A-D, as in modern audio drama, then dash, as in dash on over, then con, as in convention, duh, then dot, as in it'll be the most fun you've had in a while, period, then com, as in come on over, we'll love to see you. Madcon, your ears and brain will thank you.